Hi everyone, welcome to Wool and Spinning. My name is Rachel and I can be found pretty much everywhere as well for pearls. Uh, today's show is already episode 111. We are just getting started with the live stream, so I'm going to wait a couple minutes till everybody gathers and then we will have an opportunity to start because I'm a little bit early and um, then we'll get into the show. Welcome to Meg. Um, hi Megan and Michelle and Becky and Kat and Susanna. And thank you so much, you guys, for taking the time out of your day to spend some time with me. Welcome to new and returning viewers. You help to keep the show on the air. I really appreciate our Patreon subscribers. You guys make the show extra special, and I so appreciate the time that you spend here. So thank you so much. Uh, if there's any questions and you are wondering about anything that is happening with the show, you're wondering about anything that happens behind the scenes, uh, you can subscribe to the Wool and Spinning newsletter, which is on the blog at welfarepearls.com. It only comes out once a month, so if you're concerned about more email spam, which I know we all are, um, don't you don't have to worry about that. All right, so I we have a pretty packed show, but I'm quite concerned about my voice and how my voice is going to be able to talk for an hour straight. So I am going to get my hair out of my eyes. And um, I need to get a trim. I need to cut my hair. My hairdresser was free last night, but I had executive, so I, I, I'm going to get my hair cut next week. But hence the... <laughs> My my fringe is in my eyes. So anyways, the um, thank you for your patience with my, my tick. The... Uh, yeah, so I'm concerned about my, my voice and how it's going to be able to manage for a whole hour so if I start to really lose my voice we'll cut the show a bit a bit short and we'll pick up where we left off next show and we'll just make it a little bit longer so I know you guys never mind about that all right so what do we have in store for today we've got a little bit of chat about the breed and color studies there was one project that was posted on Instagram. She also posted it in the Ravelry thread. I highly recommend that you go and check it out. Her name is Barbara. She made pillows and they are amazing. I will feature them on the show next time, but I didn't get a chance to upload the photos into the streaming software this morning. Nora had swimming lessons and we were out all morning. So please go and check the thread or check Ravelry hashtag wool and spinning because on, on, on Instagram because they're amazing. And if you ever wonder what to do with the breed and color studies, there are always so many ideas, but they, the woven pillows really turned out well. So really well done, Barbara. And Katrina and I were ooing and awing them via text one night and sending photos back and forth and ideas and whatnot. And I just want to say, well done. So we will have a look at those uh, next time. So we've got breed and color studies. I have a work in progress that I wanted to very quickly share with you, mostly because otherwise you don't get to see the singles because it will be plied and I will have started knitting by the time the next show comes on the air because I am under a deadline with this spin. And then I've got some finished projects that I wanted to talk about, which you can sort of see a little bit of a spoiler down here. And we have a spinning growth. So not a super, super packed show, but enough to talk about that it will be full regardless because it always is. The major thing that I wanted to talk about today is my finished llama and silk throw, which is just behind me here. Um, you can see it popping up just over the camera right here in the corner. Um, and I think other than that, we need to just get right into it. So without further ado, let's get on with the show. All right, let's talk about breeding color studies. I'm gonna switch around the cameras and do a bit of clicking around here and then you guys will be able to join me again. All right, let's talk about Breed and Color Studies. Breed and Color Studies is part of Wool and Spinning. If you've been watching the podcast for a while, you know about Breed and Color Studies. Everybody is welcome to join. You can uh, use your own fiber. Katrina does a very limited run of fiber each time round for people who would like to purchase and participate with the colorway that she develops. Starry Nights, which is the colorway that she developed this time round, which is actually in the middle of the photo that you're looking at right now is available in her shop and you can order a four ounce uh, braid of fiber from her in that colorway on whatever base that you want. So it's not, the black and the white are not available anymore. They were kind of a one-time thing. However, if you want to spin with black and white and you want to engage with this study in the way that we have been engaging in it, you might not be able to get the actual Massim itself because that was our breed that we studied this time around, 
but you could order it on like Targi or something else that you really love and you could get some black Targi and you could get some white Targi and you could blend, put it in however you want to elicit the same learning outcomes. So that is a thought. Because this time around we wanted to explore black and we wanted to explore white and how those affect a control colorway, which is a colorway that had no black and no, no white in it. Because so often you see indie dyers dyeing up these gorgeous braids of comb top and it's, you know, four ounce braid of whatever and it's a colorway and it's got these gorgeous colors in it and then they throw in some white or they leave some areas of that braid undyed or they throw in some areas where they put some black in or they pour dye on and they pour black one black sometimes is one of the colors that they pour on and it totally changes the colors and it changes the color way so we thought we would explore that this time round. so we have some projects here from shara purple lemur her photos were the first ones and we have these photos from kelly these were and then we have some photos from bamboo number two bamboo two i think is how you say her ravelry username so this is bamboo here she did targi and i'm just reading what i wrote here what or what she wrote sorry she did a fractal spin and she's spinning for the shift cowl she's finished the white braid first so this was the white braid um and she was working on consistency and focusing on next to the skin softness for this skein. So she was trying to keep her twist low. She was using her Acrowork spindles, which are pictured, excuse me, sorry, which are pictured here. The Acrowork spindles are a little bit different because they're 3D, I think they're 3D printed just like their bobbins are. They're really interesting looking. I love how they, how they, um, turn how they twist the when you see demos of them on like Instagram and whatnot they look really lovely they're very smooth and she has overall the the overall goal of this spin that Bamboo 2 has been working on is her consistency I think she's doing a great job I love how the two ply comes out with lots of barber pulling and lots of interest and I really love that the finished skein is still maintains some of its puffiness and some of its life. I think sometimes we can over ply when we're trying to, you know, when you're, I don't know if she plied on spindles or not, but I know for me, sometimes with my spindles, I get going and I over ply my yarns and she did a really beautiful job there. So this is Shara's yarns. She's purple lemur on Ravelry. And I always want to say Instagram because so many of us are on Instagram and we all follow each other. So if you're ever wondering where to find people on in the Wool and Spinning group, there is a thread on the Wool and Spinning Ravelry group for to find out what pe other people's usernames are. So if you're new to this world of spinning and you're trying to find some people to follow, go into that thread because people have shared their information for where to find them on Instagram and you can you can add them on your Instagram. And then you've got some inspiration. So this was Shara's spin. She did a variety. Oh, no, no, sorry. This was uh, Kelly's, Kelly's spin. I love these yarns. She did some low twist singles and she got a grist of 1600 yards per pound, which is just incredible. She fold them and thwack them because she felt that there were some weak spots. And her twist per inch were approximately 2.5 and her twist angle was approximately 15 degrees. So really lovely yarn, really beautiful. Uh, structurally, obviously some shortcomings because of a low TPI and a low twist angle and very, and singles. So she didn't strengthen it by and improve, in, increase this, the stability of the yarn structure by plying. So instead she decided to full and thwack them which I think just turned out beautifully. It'll be really interesting. Kelly, you're in, Kelly, you're in the, uh, I think you're in the, I, th I thought I saw you. You were in the the chat. I Do you have any plans for this yarn? I was wondering what you were planning on doing with it because this is definitely a yarn that, because Massim wants to stick to itself, it's a little bit like mohair in that way. I have really found that it's quite sticky and it likes to grab onto itself. It'll be really interesting. I, I wouldn't probably recommend uh, weaving on a rigid heddle with this yarn. I, I'm not, I, I suspect it would break. But it would be interesting to see what a little sample would yield you. Uh, the other one that we wanted to feature was Shara. She did a variety of yarns. So she did a crepe yarn, a two ply, and a combo ply. She found that the black ended up, so this is still Kelly's single, so I'm telling you about the next yarn. She found that the black ended up the softest, and the ones where 
she broke them up and spun the colors all together they ended up being the most ropey which i thought was really interesting so the more she manipulated the fiber rather than just spinning it the more ropey it became and i wonder what that was about maybe it was just a smaller amount of fiber in her hand and more twist got in there that's a really interesting reflection so those, hi Lucy, so those are some of the Breed and Color Study yarns that people have been working on. I have finished my yarns back in January and I have been weaving with mine and I will tell you more about that over the coming weeks because it is just coming off my loom. I'm just about ready to kill it and I will share some more about that in March. <laughs> so I probably won't talk about it uh, on next show in February because I have some finishing work to do on that on that piece and then I will talk about it in the coming shows probably, like I said, into March. I'm actually not sure that Shara's photos came up. So if they didn't, I will look when I'm editing the photo. I will uh, include them in the next show. Let me just make a note of that because otherwise I'm gonna forget. I only saw Kelly's photos and Bamboo 2's photos came up, come up. Maybe they were in that very first photo and they were all together. And so I just kept missing it because I've got the pop-up. On YouTube, you can, when you're on the desktop mode and you're the administrator, you can actually make the pop-up a separate window. And so I move it over to where the live screen, the live stream screen is. And so it sits a little bit and it obscures some of my, some of my screen. So you guys are getting all sorts of inside information today. All right, um, are you, uh, Tiff is just wondering, are you having sticking issues weaving the Massim? Did you size it at all? I haven't started weaving it yet and have yet to size it. I did size it. Oh, there's there's um, Shara's yarns. There you go. So she did a crepe, a two ply and a combo ply. I did size them. I, I think, I have a lot I have a lot of thoughts about the Massim and why I had so much trouble with the weaving and I think probably what I'll do is rather than getting into a conversation about it now I will talk about it next time because there were it was a lot like weaving with mohair I had a lot of problems with my rigid heddle because of warping issues and I need to kind of get my thoughts together and be able to articulate exactly what happened before I start talking about it on the podcast and I end up rambling on for like 20 minutes and make no sense. And I don't want to confuse people who are new to weaving and are maybe thinking about weaving with their Massim yarns and I end up putting them off and they don't end up creating something really amazing because I freak them out. So I'm going to hold off on any comments that I have about the massim and the weaving. However, we can pick this conversation up in the Slack channel later today for sure. So let's just table the massim discussion about weaving for now with like my project and we'll talk about it in the general channel of the Slack channel. Okay. I just don't want to get sidetracked because I have a lot of thoughts and I'm actually quite frustrated with how it came out because I feel like I should have known better. And I know that's sort of silly because you don't know what you don't know until you kind of get there. But in this case, I should have known better. So let's uh, table that for now. I'm going to switch the cameras around. We're going to go to the product dominant so that I can see, so that I can see, uh, move things around here. We have some giveaways at the end of the show. One person who is in the Slack channel today is getting a calendar and one person who can't be here in the Slack channel today is also getting a calendar. So now you want to know who it is, but you got to wait. <laughs> All right. I have a spin in progress that I wanted to share with you because it will be done next time I talk to you and hopefully it will be on the wheel. I started this on Friday night because I have some stuff that I'm working on for something else that I'm working on that's outside of this podcast that I can't talk about. Isn't that horrible? I hate having to say that and do that, but I can share with you the process in the meantime regardless. So, and I will share more about that other project with you as I am able. So this is Smith and You. 
I don't actually think I have the tag still, but I'm only going to talk about this very, very quickly. Smith and You is my friend Marianne. She is up in Kamloops, British Columbia. I source a lot of stuff from up in Kamloops because my friend Lori is up there as well. And this is 80% mer Superwash Merino, 20% Nylon. It's from Deep 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 Stash. I think I bought this from Marianne in like 2014. I So for me, that's Deep Stash because I don't tend to hang on to my stuff too, too long. This was actually one of two, I'm going to call them, well, they were print, pin drafted roving, but the way that Marianne sells them, they're kind of like skeins. They're kind of cool. They kind of look like yarn, but they're pin drafted roving. It was a hundred, she says on here that it's a, that, oh, she did say it's 150 grams. So when I went to weigh it, I was like, this is way more than four ounces. This is way more than 100 grams. She did write it on here that it was 150 grams. So when I was dividing it up, I had uh, these bumps. I, I took the pin drafted roving apart and I ended up with four of these balls, which is exactly what I was hoping for because I need uh, four singles. So I'm just taking each of these little balls and spinning them to a bobbin. I have started the third one. I'm halfway through. I need to finish it by tomorrow and then this one needs to be finished by Friday morning. <laughs> I love being on spinning deadlines so much. Uh, the That's sarcasm by the way. The, the funny thing about this fiber and the reason why I got into deep stash was because I had a second one of these. So I had a total of 300 grams and way back I used one of these as a prize because I just knew that I wasn't going to spin what I'd originally planned on spinning. So originally I was going to do a massive shawl for Nora for her fifth birthday and I was going to do it with these two, with this 300 grams of, of merino nylon. And the reason why I ended up not doing it, uh, spoiler, Nora's turning five in March next month. Obviously it's not made, the shawl. The reason why I ended up not doing it is because it was the Superwash Merino Nylon and for a yarn, I just really didn't want that to be the yarn in the shawl if I was gonna do a hand spun, hand knit shawl for her. And Nora's pretty small and doing a full sized shawl for her, she's not gonna be able to wear it for many, 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 like for quite a while. So I haven't, done anything for her for her fifth birthday after all and she actually wants some other stuff so it worked out really well but I put this fiber aside to do socks with so that's what I'm doing so this is going to be a four ply sock I'm spinning it on my lendrum I haven't used my lendrum for a really super long time because I lent it out in the fall to a friend of mine and my friend Leah learned how to spin on it Katrina taught her so my lendrum's been sitting in the corner. It's actually been on the podcast a few times because it was sitting right here for a really long time. And I decided to pull it out because I am in the process of deciding what I'm going to do with all of my spinning equipment. So I'm going to go on a tangent for a couple minutes. Um, and I'm going to get my hair out of my eyes. The Hi, Catherine. Welcome for the first time to the live stream. So my spinning equipment, I have four wheels currently. I have my Magicraft Suzy Pro, which I'm not going to let go. I'm going to keep that like probably until like, it's probably going to get like buried with me. I have my Lundrum, which I don't want to, I don't want to let go of my Lundrum for two reasons. First of all, I'm on the waiting list for Lundrum Saxony. I've been on the waiting list for five years. I knew when I went onto the waiting list that the that Gord said five years ago when I first went onto the list that he wouldn't be doing a run of the Lendrum Saxony for at least seven years. So I got, actually got an email back at the beginning of January that said it, that was from the waiting from the waiting list from Gemini Fiber Arts in Ontario asking me if I still wanted to be on the waiting list because he had contacted her and said he probably would do a run in two years. So the bobbins are interchangeable between the Saxony and the Lendrum and the Lendrum Saxony is like my dream wheel. I don't know why, I've just, right from what in 2007 when I got into spinning, I've just always wanted one. I don't know why. I thought when the flat iron by Schacht was released, I thought for sure that that was the direction that I would go in. And then I would end up maybe, because I had a matchless at the time, I have my sidekick, and I figured that I would do that. But I still 
come back to the Lendrum Saxony and all of the bobbins are interchangeable and I also really love making my textured yarns and my art yarns on my Lendrum so I don't think I'm gonna let so I, I'm my Lendrum is permanent it's staying it's just slow so I'm finding as a more experienced spinner and as sort of a more um, a more intermediate spinner that I was spinning this yarn and trying to get the amount of twist into it that I need this is where I'm going with all this I just can't get the twist in like I just can't get the that amount of uh, the whirl at 17 to 1 is just not fast enough to get the amount of twist in that I need for this yarn. So I think what I'm going to do with my Lendrum is put my jumbo flyer on and use it for my art yarns and my textured yarns. I don't make them very often but I'm kind of at the point where spinning singles on on my Lendrum is just not it's just too time consuming it's too much work and if you listened to the conversation with me and Kai and Becca I can't remember what episode that was, what episode number that was. Maybe, Becca, if you don't mind having a really quick look on the Patreon post. It was it was the first part, part one. Kai talks about how much work it was, is to treadle on his wheel after he got his matchless, and he went back to his sort of beginner first wheel and how much work it was, and I really get that. I, I'm very much experiencing that with my Lundrum. So this is going to be a four ply. So I've got the third singles on the bobbin right now and it's just taking a lot of work to get it done. And the reason why I didn't do it on my Magicraft is because it was taken up with another project at the time. So what's left is my sidekick, which is possibly going to be sold. Um, I have a friend who's thinking about it at the moment. And then I have my Ashford E Spinner 3, which is currently for sale. So I would be willing to ship it if somebody was interested in it. And if you are interested in talking about that some more, just you and I, you can message me directly on Ravelry or via email, rachel at wellfordpearls.com. I just want to pare down and I want to simplify. And I think this spin and my Massim Weaving really solidified for me that I want to oh it was episode 29 Kai talking about about having to work so hard when he was treadling so thank you Becca for that I I just really want to simplify and that brings me to another conversation another um finished yarn that was a stash busting yarn it's done so this is my nest fiber studios this was club from Christmas of 2016 and the colorway was called Noel. You know, it's funny. So Suzanne said in the chat channel, I cannot even express my love, my level of obsessive love for my flat iron. I will definitely be adding a sidekick at some point as well. That's just awesome, Suzanne. I love hearing that. I think the, the flat iron is one of those wheels because Becca in our community just got one too and I know she absolutely loves hers too I think those traditional wheels the way that they're set up and the fact that you can run them in scotch tension or in double drive are they really fill a niche I don't like using the word niche because I don't think it's really a niche but I think they fill a need for those of us who are need a bigger drive wheel and I looked for a really long time about I, I, and thought about getting a Shacked Reeves and I was going to get the really big one and with the really big drive wheel with the ratios up to 64 to 1 and I, I was pricing it out and I was looking at shipping it and so on and so forth. And I really love the way that the traditional wheels run. And so I think for the more like the production spinner, the person who needs that speed, especially, um, you know, woolen spinning, I think those wheels really are a game changer. In terms of space, they're less than ideal. In terms of, you know, like their footprint, I mean. And I think a lot of the castle style wheels for many of us, you know, the Ladybug, the Lendrum, the Sidekick, uh, the, a lot of the Magicraft wheels, any of the, you know, the Matchless, etc. they are so utilitarian. They do their job so well. They're modern wheels. They have a really nice aesthetic. You can find, like, if you don't like that look, you can go with that look. I loved my Matchless so much. I still miss it. I did almost buy one of their anniversary ones this year, and I decided at the last minute to back out and not to do it. 
And I think all of these wheels, like the modern castle style wheels, and by castle, I mean we're talking about the drive wheels on the bottom and then your flyer and your maiden is on top. Whereas with a traditional wheel, you've got your drive wheel on the side and then you've got your maiden on the side, on the other side. The, you know, I think these wheels, they're so utilitarian and they're so well made. You're not making a massive investment. You know, a thousand or two thousand dollars might feel like a big investment, but when you start looking at other things out there, you know, musicians spend that on their musical equipment. You know, if it's a guitar or a piano, it's, you know, like an electric piano, not an acoustic piano. Um, but, you know, for artisans and for people who are makers and are doing this stuff is more than just a hobby. When you start looking at the price point of some of this stuff and you're looking at, you know, um, maybe earning a bit of a living doing some of this stuff, there's, I think it's really important to sort of think about what is it that you want out of that piece of equipment. And that's where the traditional wheels are great for those of us who really do want to get into more like production. They're fast, they're smooth. The flat iron fits just a wonderful uh, myriad of, of choice that I think a lot of spinners need when they get to that level where they want to be able to create a lot of different yarns in a relatively quick, quick time frame because they're fast, they're lovely. So... Yeah, it's funny. The Symphony is another really nice one. Uh, Lu Lucy said, my son says my Lendrum is the only spinning wheel. <laughs> Laugh out loud, but I love my Symphony for at home. Yeah, that, those are amazing wheels too. I was looking at a Symphony when I still had my Minstrel because then my bobbins would have been interchangeable, but I let my Minstrel go. There was a bit of a learning curve going from a castle to a Saxony style and the footprint of the flat iron is smaller than some other Saxony wheels. That's true, Suzanne. That's a really good point. Um, I was ship, shopping and shopping for a used Shaq Reeves, but I am um, flyer on the right opposite to most people. Then I read over and over of people selling their Reeves because they use, like the flat iron more. Yeah, it's interesting, Megan, that you would say that. So I've read that as well, that people prefer the flat iron over the Shaq Reeves now. I think one of the reasons for that is that the Shaq Reeves tend to be slightly more finicky wheels. At least that's what I have read. I've not ever spent on one. I just have read what all the research that I was doing last year when I was trying to decide if that's the route that I wanted to go when I was letting my matchless go because I was going to either keep my matchless, keep my sidekick and get um, a flat iron or I was going to let my matchless go, eventually let my sidekick go and go in a different direction. And uh, I think the thing with the flat iron is it's just, it's so modern and the shocked wheels are really well put together. You know, either you love them or you hate them and usually the reason why you don't like them is because the orifice isn't the right height, you're too small, short you're too tall um there's things about them that maybe don't fit for you but it's not because they're not great wheels it's usually just a personal preference so you know all of this wheel talk i mean we could we could spend the next two hours talking about wheels and we wouldn't have any answers per se but the reality is i am trying to pare down i'm trying to pare down my footprint in our house so that i can focus on one or two tools that work really really well for me and stashing down a little bit, so continuing to stash, stash down, I should say, so that I can continue to focus on what I, what doing what I love to do most, which is spinning yarn and then, and then working with them. I have something in my eye, sorry. Um, I think it's a piece of, of fuzz or fluff or something. So I finished this yarn. I'm going to move on because you guys, you guys keep talking about wheels and I'm, I'm going to move on a little bit. So remember my crate, my yarn, my my Noel yarn. I was really, really torn about. I didn't mean to touch it, and I've now I completely tangled it up. Um, I was really torn about what to do with it because I was so bored, and I was spinning and spinning and spinning, and it just really wasn't working. And in in terms of like inspiration, I wasn't very excited about it. The color that's coming up on your monitor isn't right. It's not coming up on my monitor particularly correct. I'm not sure if it would come up better over here. It's a little bit better, but this is more true to the color up here. This is a bit blown out. I think it's because of the red and the blue sitting next to each other. It just doesn't really work. So what I decided to do, I spun my second singles and I still was feeling completely uninspired by it. So I took the third bump of the fiber and I spun it in the opposite direction. So I actually have no idea. I spun two singles going, no, I spun, I had finished the first singles going Z twist, so that's anti-clockwise. And then it, I started spinning the second singles S twist. 
<clears throat> and I figured, well, I'll get to the end of this and I'll decide what I want to do. Because I was thinking at that point, maybe doing an opposing three ply. In the end, I spun a second bobbin going S twist, which is counterclockwise. Sorry, S twist going counterclockwise, Z twist going clockwise. And it's hard talking to the camera because my hand is going the opposite way. And I plied it, the two ply, the two S twist singles, I plied Z twist together to make a two ply. And then I did a crepe yarn. So on Instagram, there is a awesome hashtag going right now called spin ply crepe. It's because of the cover of the ply magazine. Let me just grab my copy. I haven't even taken this out of the plastic. Isn't that horrible? My favorite magazine and I haven't even taken it out of the, out of the plastic. I am saving this issue and my current spin-off issue for when we go away on March break. We're, we've got uh, two weeks for spring break and we're going away for one of the weeks. Excuse me, sorry. We're, uh, we're just going up to Whistler, but um, I... I've been saving them because usually I get quite a bit of time to read and have some quiet time when we're when we do that camping trip. So right here um, on the cover was some crepe yarn, and Debbie Held is wrote the article, and she's the I, I think I haven't actually read it, but I'm sure it was Debbie who has started this thing about crepe yarn and sock yarn. It's fantastic. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I had crepe yarn on my list for in the fall when we explore more sock yarns again in the fall. We're going to explore sock yarns in the community from April until June and then we're going to explore them again from October till December because that's what you guys had asked for back when we did our last sock content back in 2018. So this isn't sock yarn. <laughs> uh, this is sport weight. It is probably 16 wraps per inch. It might even be 15. And it ended up being about 360 yards. So not, not fantastic for me for, for socks. I can usually get 450, 500 yards for socks. So hence why this is sort of more of a sport weight. And, but it turned out really well. And it's an interesting yarn. It's a little bit muddy. The colors got jumbled up quite a bit. It's not my favorite yarn. I don't love it. I didn't love the colors in the braid either though. But it's an interesting yarn. It's textured. I love crepe yarn. I've always loved crepe yarn. And I'm really excited to explore this some more and maybe pull out some other yarn out of my stash and do another crepe on a different yarn and go for sock yarn and then knit with it. My friend Diana did some, she was our woolen spinning radio guest this month so I, i'm going to release that that episode today or tomorrow for everybody in the patreon community but her and i had a chat and she was working on her crepe yarn when we were uh having the discussion and recording and she was knitting on it last night and it looked awesome so i hope that i will get an opportunity over the next couple months to make some more of this yarn and you guys, and we'll explore a little bit more about this yarn in the community. Crepe yarn's really neat because you basically take um, a two ply or a three ply, however much you want. You take a two, in this case it was a two ply, and you place twice as much ply twist in it as you normally would. And then you take a singles that is spun in the same direction as your plied yarn, and you ply, you cable basically, you crepe, the two ply and the and the single together in the opposite direction so it's all about spinning direction you need to pay attention to which direction your singles were spun in the in the first place so if you have two z spun singles and you ply them s twist you need to have a single spun s twist to then crepe z twist i know that's a lot but write it down, make sure that you keep track of which direction you're spinning in. This is where spinning to the left or spinning to the right isn't kind of enough vernacular. You need to start thinking as you progress in your spinning career, you need to start thinking in terms of spinning Z, spinning S, so that when you sit down and look at your yarn and you inspect it, you can say, oh, that's an S twist. I plied it or craped it S twist. 
um, because the, the, the fibers are, the, the singles are slanted in that direction. So start thinking about that. When we talk about, uh, in some of the content, when I talk about examining our yarns and measuring our yarns, that's one of the things that we're looking for is which direction was it plied in, which direction was it spun in. And we'll talk about that more and more over the coming year because, as we explore the sock content that's up and coming in the spring and then again in the fall. So that's that yarn. It's, it's okay. I really liked making it. It was fun to make. It was fun to spin in all the different directions. And I ended up plying it on my Magicraft and I put it on the fastest whirl, which is 28 to 1. So it was pretty fast to ply and then to crepe. So it went out really well. All right. Yeah, Diana's just a wealth of information. She's just wonderful. I love her energy and I love how excited she always is about spinning. It's just, it's totally and completely infectious. She, her and Felicia always, uh, Felicia Lowe of Sweet Georgia, whenever I talk to them, because I happen to have been on two Skype calls, one with Diana and one with Felicia over the last couple weeks. And whenever I talk to either of them, I always come away just like I'm buzzing. I just, I always feel like I'm like buzzing with ideas and inspiration and it's really, really great. So Diana blogs over at hundredmilewear.com. I would highly recommend that you check out her, her blog. <clears throat> oh, Michelle, your son's been begging you to take him to Whistler with your, his mountain bike. Oh my goodness, you have to go. So in the village, have you, I don't know if you've ever been, but in the village, they hook the bikes onto the back of the uh, chairs, of the chair lifts in the, in the spring, summer, and fall. And the course that the kids get to come down on, kids, adults, you see dads with their kids all the time. It's it's just as many adults as it is kids um, coming down on the course. It's just fantastic. And there's all these different levels. Like they can come down the harder courses. They can come down easier courses. It's just awesome. So, yeah, you need to take them. <laughs> um, all right. You guys are continuing to talk about yarn, so I'm going to let, or sorry, spinning wheels, so I'm going to let you continue to do that, and we are going to move on to my Hauser yarn. I didn't talk about this yarn tons and tons on the podcast because it was such a stinker to ply, and we did talk about that on the show, and then I was knitting with it, so I told you guys that I would share with you my finished socks when they were done, and they are done. I... I want to go out on a limb and say that these are probably my favorite socks I've ever knit. I always say that, or at least I say that quite often, but I might actually, these are going to be pretty hard to top. This yarn is so much work to make. It's a four ply. All of the singles are spun in the same direction. And then you take two of those four bobbins and you ply them together and then you take the other two and you ply them together so you end up with two two ply yarns that are spun and plied in the same direction and I'm pointing this way because I spin my stuff said or I spun my stuff said from there you take those two two ply yarns that aren't really plied together I use that term very loosely and you cable them by going in the opposite direction and you put the two yarns together to create a four ply. In some ways it's kind of a glorified four ply because it, like it just a glorified simple four ply because the two two ply yarns don't really ply together and you sort of end up with these two two ply yarns where the singles just don't want to be friends and they kind of lay next to each other but they're so overspun that they have to be friends. And then you take those two bobbins and you ply them together. So it's a crap ton of work. And you're putting in so much twist. And it's it's just it's a lot of work. The results are so worth it. Like these socks are just amazing. I knit these on two millimeter needles. They were very fast to knit. The texture in the actual yarn and like the color I mean not not texture in terms of feeling but texture in terms of the heathering I think is is really beautiful you can see how much color was in the original fiber this was hedgehog fiber superwash merino and nylon you can see how much color was in the original yarn like it's just incredible there was black in there and pink and purple and yellow and green and blue and I think there's probably like every color and the cool thing is that because there was black there are these sections in the sock that are black 
that have black as one of the singles. In knitting the two pairs of socks from start to finish, I was watching for a section where all four singles were exactly the same color, not once in the entire sock pair. So neither sock was there ever a spot where all four singles were the same color. So even in here, like where it looks like it maybe was where they matched up or like where some of this pink is, it looks like the, the singles are solid. They're not, they're totally heathered. There's one or two of those singles were a different color, which is really cool. They were so neat to, so neat to knit. They were interesting. I think that's why they got done so fast. They, the ribbing is really, really tight. And I'll actually take one off because this is the takeaway. They are so elastic, it is incredible. They're like store-bought socks. When you wear them, when you put them on, because I tried them on, I haven't woven in the ends yet, so I haven't worn them yet. Um, they feel like store-bought socks because they are so elastic. And like, look at the ribbing at the top. It doesn't want to stay stretched out. It pops right back in immediately. Unlike other socks where you can kind of hold it out and it doesn't feel like there's any tension on your, on your hand. These want to go right back right away. They are so cool. Totally worth the extra work. Totally worth it. So I'm sold on Hauser yarn. <laughs> I was talking to Felicia about it and we were both commenting how, you know, it's this one, one page, one, one double page spread in Sarah Anderson's book about Hauser yarn. It's almost like an afterthought the way that it's put into the book. And you read it and you think, yep, nope, not doing that. It's too much work and you move on. And this really was an experiment in a leap of faith in trying something that you think, yeah, maybe there's something to it. Definitely worth it. Totally worth it. And that's really all I have to say about them. <laughs> I just love them. I'm just going to catch up on the chat because you guys are chatting quite a bit. And I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. The two ply step is the same direction as the singles. Yeah, so we're talking about the Z, the four, the Hauser yarn, the up plying. You're right, Becca. I called it um, uh, plying, but yeah, it's called up plying. So when you're when you're plying in the same direction that you spun your singles, it's called up plying, up 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 plying. And I couldn't remember what that phrase was. So thank you, Becca. <clears throat> Those socks are fabulous. I love purples. Thank you, Michelle. I was going to I was going to do this on an up spin a upcoming spin. Awesome. Oh, thank you you guys for the kind words about the socks. Yeah, they this project went so fast. And of course we will be exploring this yarn some more in upcoming uh, how I spin vlogs and upcoming how I spin downloads. So you will be hearing more about that if you are a subscriber of that content. The last thing that I want to talk about is my llama and silk wrap. So I'm going to show you the yarn first and then we're going to change the cameras around. My llama silk wrap ended up really being really big and I forgot to measure it, but this was the original yarn and the original yardage that I had for the yarn was roughly 800 spun yards. It was, it was actually close to 900 because it was like 830, 840. And the yarn, the, this was the yarn that I went to finish and I finished it in, in hot water and the yellow of the silk dyed the llama. Uh, originally it was just a, a tawny brown llama and then the yellow silk that was, that was carded throughout ended up bleeding all over the llama and dyed everything that, that kind of yellowy color. But that's the, the original yarn. And then let me move my cameras around. Okay. It is huge. I have finished and washed this and I didn't felt it. <laughs> so this is it folded. I fit, I've, fin I've completely finished this. So this is totally and completely done. I left the fringes completely unfinished. I did not do a, f a twisted fringe. I just left them. I'm a bit worried over time that it'll get a bit messy, but I'm just gonna leave it for now. And uh, I really like what the blanket looks like without the fringes being finished. 
I finished my, um, oh, I should tell you guys, I finished my purple wrap as well. I'll grab it. It's right here. I've even worn it a whole bunch. I've worn it oh, quite a few times. So this is finished. It didn't felt. I wet, I wet finished it. It looks amazing. I've had so many compliments on it. I've been wearing it like this, minus obviously my, my shawl that I'm wearing today. Um, but yeah, it just, oh, it turned out so well. I'm so happy with it. Um, but yeah, I finished it and then I was worried about the purple bleeding. I was worried that the purple would bleed in the bathtub uh, when I went to finish it because it was it's a you know it's a long piece of fabric so I decided to throw it into the bathtub and I because it was quite warm water I didn't want it like I didn't want it to bleed so I did it I did it last um, I, I did this one first and I'll just show you so this is it it's still folded in half and then this is it opened up so it's huge. It has amazing drape. I mean, you can see you can see how how well it moves. The trick is wearing it. I'm not sure that I'm ever going to be able to wear this thing, and so I'm trying to decide like what to do with it because it's uh yeah, it's it's not really a piece of fabric like it's so big that I, you know I'm not really sure that you can really wear it. The other thing that I could do is sew up the sides. Sorry, just give me a sec here. I could sew up the sides and I could make it into like a poncho. Let me see if I can get into the camera. Um, the thing is, is that like it's still, it's a lot of fabric to be wearing and it's so warm because of the llama. So it may end up just being, actually what it might end up being, it looks amazing with our quilt. Uh-oh. It's stuck on something. Oh, it's stuck on me. Uh, it looks amazing at the bottom of our bed and we have a king size bed. And the quilt that's on our bed is my mom made for our wedding present because my mom's a quilter. She's a beautiful sewer, beautiful. And I was actually thinking, you know, when you go to like a um, hotel and they have the folded, uh, it's usually a blanket that's at the bottom of the bed, but it like sets off the bed and makes it look like it's like set. Um, I was actually thinking about putting it there. <laughs> just for show because it's warm and you could pull it up over top of you if you wanted something warm to pull onto you like if you're sitting in bed I do a lot of writing in bed and because I write in my in my journal and in my diary every night and you know you could pull this up onto your lap as sort of a lap blanket and then you could have it laying uh, across the bottom of the bed the rest of the time to show it off and actually, to be honest with you, that's what I think is going to happen to it because it's just such an amazing piece. And I am so happy with how it turned out that I kind of want to display it. I was thinking about putting it on the back of one of our couches, but because of the kids and the dogs and oh my goodness, Charlotte. So our, 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 do our dog, I shouldn't say dogs anymore because Charlie's not with us anymore, but Char Charlotte, it got so warm here in the, at the beginning of January before we got this cold snap that we're having now. We actually have snow on the ground, which is crazy. She started blowing her undercoat. So it just is hair everywhere. And I don't want hair to get into some of this stuff. So throwing something like this onto the back of a couch isn't really what I want to do. Anyways, it's just some of the stuff that I was thinking about. But I was thinking we are trying to redo some of the stuff in our room and I'm trying to clean up and get my stuff put away. So the only wall, <laughs> I'm trying to clean up and get my stuff put away, but the only wall in our house where I can mount a warping board is in our bedroom. <laughs> so I haven't told my husband yet and I've already ordered it. So I'm just going to put it up when he's at work, probably on Friday, and I'm not going to tell him and I'm going to see if he notices. <laughs> I know that's kind of mean, but 
if I tell him, then he won't want me to put it up. You know, it's funny. So Diane says that she loves a made bed and I keep a quilt at the bottom and I just love pulling it up over me. That is wonderful. I'm a professional bed maker because of nursing school and we had to make the bed a certain way and they would like bounce coins on the bottom to make sure that the coins bounced. Yes, I've been nursing that long that they still did that. And I hate making the bed. I never make our kids make their beds. I hate making our bed. Often it's Mike that will make it, but he's not very good at it. And I just hate it. And that's actually one of the reasons why we're trying to like fix up our bedroom is because I think if we had, if we didn't have my stuff, my making stuff sort of strewn out everywhere and have like my stash overflowing everywhere and it was more like our room was a bit more or not just organized but like put together I it would probably incentivize me to make the bed because when our room is in really it's really tidy and really clean I make the bed and I don't even think about it so that's actually where that idea came from because I hate making the bed so I think it's because I got yelled at in nursing school all right, let's move on to spinning growth. <laughs> Diane says she hates it. She hates it too, but she loves how it looks and feels. Okay, fair enough, Diane. <laughs> All right, I am starting to lose my voice, so I am just cognizant of moving along. Have a look at this amazing fiber from Silver Macaroons on Ravelry. She entered into the spinning growth thread, which is in the Ravelry group, and this is what she had to say. So I have a yarn that I like now, but did not like right after I spun it. And I learned that I sometimes have to put something aside for a while before I finished working on it. Also, I can go against the rules anytime I feel like it. I love that. So I got this very bright braid and I was hoping to blend the colors a bit to mute them. And instead I got a very extreme barber pole yarn and it was a yarn I spun in the first few months of spinning, so it's to be expected that it didn't turn out as I was expecting. At first I hated it because I had been taught that barber pulling is bad, and after over a year of not thinking about the yarn, I decided I wouldn't mind it that much after all. And even though next time I would do it differently, I and even though next time I would do it differently, I will still happily wear the gloves I made. Aren't those gloves amazing? This is a really great opportunity to remind ourselves that we all have to start somewhere. And we have to start with our color management and how we approach the braids that we spin, that we buy, with an open mind when we're first learning. And even as an experienced spinner, we can still make yarns that we're not super, super happy with how we manage the color. And I'm holding this one up that I showed you guys earlier because this is a great example. This would be a yarn that I would throw into spinning growth. I might actually. Uh, because there are so many things that you can learn from these spins that don't go as planned or don't go the way that you had hoped originally that it went. Things can muddy, things can get colors can get muted, colors can get brighter, the way that you spin isn't maybe the way that you thought would work for the fiber that you're doing. Uh, maybe you spun short forward and you wished you had done more of a woolen draft. There's so many things, right? And so being patient with ourselves and being kind to ourselves, just like she is in her post, I think is so important. And I love hearing that and reading that because that's exactly, just moving my hair, sorry, because I think that's exactly what we as makers need to do is to be kind to ourselves and to put stuff aside. I don't know the number of times that I have talked about this on the podcast that I'm so frustrated with X, Y, or Z and I put it aside and then I bring it out later and I actually really like it. There was this theory that I read a long time ago and somebody mentioned it on one of the, on a podcast a long time ago. I have no idea where I heard it. I have no idea where it came from. I'm sure there are those of you in the chat channel who would be able to, like who would say that you, you've you heard this before. It's almost like in the lifespan of a project from start to finish, you almost have to go through these periods of time where you don't like what you're making. 
you don't like the yarn you don't like the fiber prep you don't like how it's spinning up you don't like how it's plied you don't like how it did this you don't like that and then you go to knit with it and it's like oh my goodness this is the most amazing thing ever how many times have I said to you guys I really don't like this yarn and then I go to work with it and the finished product is amazing and I think that's something that you know when we're kind to ourselves just like she is in this post it's not what I was expecting but I didn't hate it you know, it's just part of the life cycle of a project, right? It has to go through these beautiful phases and it has to go through these ugly phases. And that just seems to be the way that our making is. You know, you get, you hear weavers on like podcasts when they're interviewed, right? And they'll say, oh, I got the warp on and I just couldn't believe how ugly it was. And then they finish it and they're like, it's the most, the most amazing thing ever. <coughs> it, it's just part of our making and it's part of our learning. A couple of the things that I wanted to say was that brighter colors do tend to barber pull more so than the more muted colors. And it's not because they barber pull more or less per se, it's that it's more noticeable. So when you have a bright color barber pulled with another bright color, they tend to accentuate each other. And there was a spin that I did a long time ago, and I'm going to try to find it while I'm talking, that that was exactly the intention, was to try to get the yarn, the finished yarn, to barber pole to be as bright as possible. And that was Felicia's goals in her spinning right up for the fiber club for that month. So when I was still spinning club for her in the write up, she that's exactly what she wanted me to do was to to apply it so that the colors would match up and barber pole as much as possible. And you would end up with this absolutely bright and crazy yarn. And that's exactly what happened. It's just a crazy yarn. So you get the purple next to the orange, which are complements, and they make each other brighter. And then you throw the white in there and it mutes some of the purple and some of the yellow where the white mixed with those colors, just to bring it down a notch. But again, it ends up being this really bright, bright, bright yarn which is cool. So sometimes we want to do that intentionally. Other times we don't and we want to keep those colors clean and we don't want to have those colors barber pull with one another but we still want to maintain their brightness and the only other thing that you can really do that I can think of in those situations is to chain ply or Navajo ply and that's the only other way to keep those colors really bright. That said, in this yarn that she spun, there are some places where the colors did match up and where she ended up with it didn't barber pull the entire yarn and if she hadn't have spun it the way that she spun it in the finished mittens she would have lost the yellow she would have lost the blue and she would have lost that gor gorgeous uh, turquoise because even though they do barber pull with one another and create that interest in the knitted fabric you also end up with in the knitted fabric, those colors being clean in places. And that to me is where the beauty of the mittens are because it creates movement and it creates interest. And that's why the finished project works so well and why they're so pleasing to the eye. I really, I really like them. So I'm just gonna check the chat to see if you guys have anything to say. Ah, Judy says I should use the warping board to display the blanket. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, maybe Mike wouldn't notice then because the blanket's very similar to our wall color. Maybe it'll just all blend in and he won't even notice. I really dislike it when we pass along ideas that certain yarns are bad. Yeah, I agree with you, Becca. I think the reality is, is every project that we spin and every project that we make is just different. Some stuff turns out more to our expectations and what we had originally planned and other stuff doesn't. And that is all part of the learning process, but also partially our own biases and what we do and don't like. And it doesn't make a yarn good or bad, it just makes it different or maybe different from our aesthetic of what we prefer. And often, you're right, Tiff, the, the, the skein looks really different from the woven or knit item, and so often that is the case. You're right. That happens a lot. You've got the skein of yarn, and it looks one way, and then you go to knit with it or weave with it, and it completely changes what it looks like. One of the things that I'm going to do with this yarn, I guess we can't really use this now for spinning growth because I'm telling you everything that I would tell you in, in spinning growth if we did it. One of the things that I'm going to do with this yarn is I'm actually going to put it on my Zoom Loom and look at what it would look like woven. 
because sometimes that can help to inform your future decisions because one of the things that I had thought about with this yarn that I could do is these colors look amazing on my sister-in-law and I was even thinking about using this as a warp and then doing a white weft and is playing with color that way so you'd have the texture of the warp from the yarn and then I was thinking about finding like a so some sort of a you know a boucle or something a white commercial commercial weaving yarn uh, for the for the weft so all these things that we can think about our imagination is our only limit I really love that Barbara Pohl look I think it gives so much depth absolutely Suzanne I totally agree with you so with Katrina because we've talked about it so much her and I I find I may spin a yarn for a purpose and I don't like it, but it is perfect for a completely different purpose. Oh my goodness, Lucy, that happens so much. Um, I can think of about four yarns off the top of my head where that was exactly the case. I thought that I was on this mission to spin X, Y, or Z and I ended, so that I could knit whatever, and I ended up, once I got to the knitting, doing going in a totally different direction. For some reason, I equate Barbara pulling to more of a homespun yarn look, probably because it's not dyed after being spun. Yeah, I think that's probably part of it, Tiff. The other thing I think, too, is some of these um, beginner yarns that you see that are hand spun, we often get a lot of barber pulling, and then when they knit up, they have a certain look to them, and I think that's very much, it goes part and parcel with hand spun and that look that people often associate hand spun with. I think in, on Ravelry, when spinning first started making a really big comeback about 10 years ago and really a big 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 comeback about five years ago the people that were starting to spin were mo most of us are self-taught or mostly self-taught and i think that when that happens there's a lot of hiccups around like color management and the types of patterns that work for hand spun or that look that's that hand spun look spin cycle yarns while they're not hand spun anymore have that look they're going for that look that's what they're trying to create in their yarns if you're not familiar with spin cycle yarns you can just look them up on on instagram they started as a hand spinning company and then eventually moved to mill spun but they still dye all their own, all their own uh, fiber and roving and stuff. The, the, the thing is uh, about those, th that look is there's a lot of trial and error and you end up being very hamstrung by sort of how things end up looking. And I think that is what has kind of created that look that, oh, that's, that's that hand spun look. And it doesn't necessarily, it's not always the case. It's just, it's got that, that color management kind of, you know, the yarns barber pole and they sort of knit up a certain way. All right. Oh, that's too bad that Meg had to go because she won one of the calendars. So get back to work, Meg, and we'll talk to you soon. Uh, for the January episode thread giveaway, we're just going to move on to a little bit of housekeeping and then I'm going to let you guys go. The calendar giveaway for the January episode thread was post number four. Congratulations to Megan. That was um, Meg. She's Puddle Glum on here and Likey Meg on Ravelry. And for the Patreon calendar giveaway that we do every month, it was um, Carlotta actually. And she knows I've gotten her address and that's going to be popped in the mail for her later this week. So congratulations to Carlotta and to Megan. If you haven't had a chance to look at the new welcome video on YouTube, it is now posted. It's also posted on Inst on Patreon if you're wondering about what's happening here over the next year and you're just wondering what's what's the Patreon all about and what's wool and spinning all about, you can have a look there um, either on Patreon or on YouTube. If you're a new viewer to the YouTube channel, the video will come up right away. The darkness was off on the video. I was going to reshoot it, but to be honest with you, I needed to move on to other things. So I'm sorry about the darkness, but the gist of the message is all there. And it is probably a good place to start if you're just wondering about the community and what there is to offer here for you. The Woolen Spinning Newsletter I mentioned at the beginning of the show is available through patreon.com. Just subscribe at the top. It is free. There's one per month. They come out on the 14th each month and it just gives you a rundown on all the things that are going on in the community so that you don't miss anything. If you are not a patron of the community, some of the links will take you to Patreon only posts, but it gives you an idea of what's up and coming and what's happening in the community should you choose to trial anything or to look at anything in more detail. And there's also all of the links to the podcast episodes and anything that is happening that is for everybody. 
The last thing that I wanted to mention, and this is probably the most important thing other than our giveaways, of course, is that I have decided to begin accepting some support for the show from small business owners and makers who would like to get their name and their brand out there. So if you're interested in learning more, I have linked down below in the show notes a link that you can have a look at on wellfordpearls.com as to what that looks like in terms of 30 second versus 90 second sort of ads that I will read out and what the expectation is from you and from me. And if you are interested in exploring that some more, you can email me and I will send you pricing. I think it's quite an aggressive pricing strategy. I don't think it's anything out of out of the realm of what other what other podcasts ask for 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 advertisement and it gives the show a little bit more support in terms of being able to do even more here at Woolen Spinning. I would be reading those sort of advertisements out towards the beginning of the show before we take that break for the title slide and then get into the bulk of the show. So it would be sort of towards the beginning of the show and you'd have an opportunity to get your name out there as a maker or a small business owner. So if spinning is sort of your niche and you're trying to get the word out there, that's maybe something that you want to think about. I think that is everything for today. I love that you guys are so chatty today. I am so, I I just, I'm so bowled over all the time at, at how much there is to talk about and explore in this community and all the things that we all think about on a regular basis and reflect upon and like it's just awesome so thank you so much to everybody who tuned into the chat channel today thank you to you for watching and for continuing to support the show whether by viewing on on youtube and pressing subscribe liking the video or um through patreon i so appreciate the time that you spend here with me until next time happy spinning and i hope that you get some making done i have some stuff that i am working on that i will hopefully be able to share with you in the next month or so so fingers crossed I can get onto a loom in the next couple weeks (laughs) like a real loom not a rigid heddle (laughs) so I'll let I'll keep you guys posted about all that all right until next time happy spinning bye guys